This is for the whole community. Infosec. Hacking. Playing on that red team. They're trying to find me. They're always thinking I am an APT. Playing on that red team. They're trying to find me. They're always thinking I am an APT. Pop your box. Hit your sight with that cross sight. Read your traffic. Caught a bug out of mid flight. Decrypt traffic. Now I can see your shit in plain sight. Website dead. Now the whole sock flipping out. Snatch your data. I got your sis so fucking tripping out. On it, cake. If you need that fucking old day, bugging out. I made a million a day. Hacker one got me starting in that rape, rape. Playing on that red team. They're trying to find me. They're always thinking I am in APT. Playing on that red team. They're trying to find me. They're always thinking I am in APT. Sir. Happy Sunday. I would like to invite you guys to the Hackers Mindset Sunday Conversations. I am your host, Marco Figaro, and today we have a good friend of mine, Chris Gates. He's been around for as long as I can remember, making a huge impact on cybersecurity. He's given talks at and and talks at so many conferences, and he's continued his commitment to writing blog posts on hacking for over 13 years. Chris has an extensive experience, if you don't know him, on network and web application, pen testing. He's a positive influence on the cybersecurity community. Chris, welcome. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I am very excited because first, can you let the viewers know your background and what you've done over your amazing career. Yeah. Um, let's see. I am a West Point graduate. I graduated in 2002, went into the army as a communications officer. It's called a signal officer, but I've gotten into the habit of just saying communications because no one knows what a signal officer is. So I did uh, layer two, layer three things out in the middle of the woods and in remote places, trying to make that stuff work. Uh, Security had been my hobby then. I was doing work with um, Joe McRae on Learn Security Online. I don't know if anybody remembers that site um, while I was in the Army. Yep. And uh, when I got out, I, um, you know, the work I did with him and the networking I had done along the way uh, convinced someone from the U.S. Army Red Team to give me a shot doing red teaming. And so this was in 2008, 2008. Um, that was like my first um, outside of the army red team gig, and I've been doing off 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 since off sec since then. Uh, variety of places, uh, army red team, um, Lara's Rapid Seven, uh, Facebook Uber Cruise, and now um, I'm at a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency exchange now as their director of offensive security, building an offensive security team there. So that's you've been there the last year. Correct. Yeah. I just hit my ear mark there. Yeah. That's been a pretty interesting experience. We, we can go into that too. Yeah. Um, let's go into it. What, yeah. what have you been doing there the last year? So the last year I got, I mean, I got brought in to build a team uh, to build an offsec function. And so we have some really great offensive people. Um, you know, Ryan O'Hara, uh, Aaron, I'm going to mess up his last name for He's over at Facebook's red team. Uh, Tim Malcolm. Fett. There's a lot of people that have had like pretty high profile who've been running red teams. Um, but there was not really a book on how to build an offset team or build a red team. They, one kind of came out after like six months after I started. Um, this written by, I think the guy that's running the red team at Uber, but um, yeah, it was to like build an offset function and really understand what offensive security function should do for an organization, uh, which is a bit different than running the red team. So in this case, it's a small company. So my four pillars of things that I had to work on are uh, vol management, which makes everyone cry. Um, Pen testing, adversarial simulation, you know, most people call it purple teaming, and then red teaming. Um, and we don't have to get into the like defining each and every one of those, or especially debate red teaming because it's tiresome. But um, the idea was to take, take this company that was doing very good on the security side and start saying, what can we find new? What are the new threats? What are, what are things we are missing? <clears throat> Where can we validate detections? Where can we do all those things in order to just become better? And why the job is interesting is um, if you look at the 
type of APT actors that go after cryptocurrency exchanges, mm-hmm. like they are heavily, heavily targeted. Yeah. And I would say at most previous companies, um, having an adversary was like a boogeyman and kind of hard to explain. Like, great example, um, like at Uber, like, I don't know if even stealing all the intellectual property there would have been that great for you, <clears throat> right? Because it's really about the network that Uber has and all the people that are on the platform that makes the thing great. You can't just lift those and steal them. Uh, where in this case, you know, <clears throat> with cryptocurrency, once the Bitcoin or other key, uh, crypto is stolen, it doesn't, there's no undo button. There's no swift network to roll that back or reroute the funds. Like it's gone. And we, there's, there are APT groups that are you know actively targeting all the crypto exchanges. Mm-hmm. So um, it's been important to do a good job. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that's been the big, I think really been the big difference rater is like actively targeted. Um, and it, it, fiscally matters if, if, if we don't do a good job on the security team, like, um, especially crypt, the crypto space is very, very, um, picky. Like the crypto Twitter is ab- probably ex- exponentially worse than InfoSec Twitter and they don't handle bad PR well. So most of the exchanges that have, you know, that have security incidents, they don't last. So uh, it's, imp- it's paramount not to get owned. And we spend a lot of time thinking about that and working for that not to happen. Wow. And how are you building your team? How do you select the individuals that you want to go ahead and hire? Uh, man, that's a good question. Um, you gotta be, you gotta be into, gonna be into Bitcoin for number one, um, which maybe limits some people, but really looking for, you know, I think Ken Johnson and I, CK Tricky and I have talked a bit about this at other, t- some of our talks, but, uh, it starts to become really important that intersection of application security and uh, network security, which I don't think a lot of people talk about or think about. As as I came up, and maybe less so now, but as I came up, the AppSec people are over here doing their thing, and all the NetSec people were over here doing their thing, and they really didn't didn't merge too much. You know, they were separate assessments, separate kind of engagements. But now in a DevOps world, and in a place where everyone builds all their own infrastructure, it's really becoming important to be able to look at source code and find RCEs and logic bugs in that source code and also do some old school networking things because, you know, uh, what's old is new with cloud. But yeah, so yeah, someone that can do multiple languages, someone that understands NetSec, someone that understands AppSec. Um, and then uh, it's hard to probably quantify in, in a few sentences, but understanding people that have that curiosity and that mindset that want to um, learn things because there's not a hacking exposed cryptocurrency book. There's, you know, you need to go read like the mastering Bitcoin book to start and really start understanding how some of these protocols work under the hood um, to start to understand how someone would try to steal money or how we would abuse that. How would we abuse that internally to be an internal threat and steal things? Um, You know, there's not, that's just, it's not stuff people tweet about. There's no medium articles about how to, how to rob an exchange. So you got to kind of be a self-starter and be able to dig in and, and figure that stuff out. Quick question. I know you hire people on their skills. How do you determine if they have that team player mentality, that trust that you would have when you're hiring maybe five interviews, six interviews, right? It's still hard to figure out, Hey, is this the right person? What do you, what do you try to do? Use my intuitive guidance system. No, yeah. um, that's, that's partly the answer is I, I, I think about how I feel when I'm talking to the person, am I getting a trustworthy vibe? Am I getting a, um, this person wants to learn vibe. Um, but, um, I mean, we team interview, so it's, it becomes a consensus. Do does everyone think this person is a good fit? And, uh, does, did their, did their, um, interview demonstrate that they would be a good fit? Um, that's actually a um, very tough question. Um, the person I hired, I worked with, the first person I hired, I worked with before. Yeah. So I kind of already knew all the goods and bads about this person. Um, I, for me, I have a rule, <laughs> right? I never go to another job, to another company, if I don't know someone that works there. That's Ooh. my rule. Because That's they're going to give me, they're going to know me, and they're going to know, is that place the right fit for me? That's a good rule. Uh, in this case, a bunch of the people that work here, I worked with at other places. Okay. So that's really what makes, uh, there's a lot of work in it. I mean, you've worked at small places, I think. Yeah. When you work at a small place, there's a lot to do. 
And the, the, the great thing about working for a small company and the bad thing about working for a small company is if you don't do it, it doesn't get done. Mm-hmm. A lot of places you could be like, oh, well, that other team will pick that up. <laughs> I mean, the other team is the same team here. So there's no like passing the buck or hoping somebody else will pick it up. Like if you don't do it, you're just putting something else on someone else's already full plate. Um, yeah, definitely. So, so yeah, that's a good rule. I, I like that. Um, yeah, that is my rule. If, if I'm going blind into a company, I, I just, yeah, I always make sure that someone that I know works there. If a company to me, like a Tesla at the, at this time, I don't know anyone that works there. Right. But if I wanted to go, I know a friend used to work there and I kind of know the culture because through that person that used to work there, I'm not going to Tesla or anything like that. But for me, when I'm going to another company, someone that I know has to work there or has previously worked there and they would give me that, that light that I need to understand, Hey, what, I be a good fit in that company. And that's the rule yeah. that I have. So- I want the, uh, I mean, I want the real deal on that because um, hiring managers and recruiters are trying to fill slots. Oh yeah. Your friend is going to let you know if, if it really is a good place to work or not. Yeah. Um, or they'll at least be straight. If they're a good friend, they'll be straight up about the pros and cons of that. Cause I have a lot of people ask me what it was like to work at Facebook mm-hmm. and I was like, well, you know, it's one, it's very different than now than it was five years ago when I was there, just from like a political climate mm-hmm. uh, or the, I'd say for the public relations climate. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to just be okay with that component of that. And yeah. some people are and some people aren't. But, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I will and, always, so I, I can have to give the pros and cons. Yeah. I will always remember uh, the video, I believe, or picture you tweeted when you was presenting to Mark Zuckerberg and that, uh, Oh, yeah. I, I that was always, awesome. Yeah, I always remember that. Those are snapshots and memory of of like certain people that I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that. That was one of those moments of you know, <clears throat> I you know I grew up in Arkansas. Most people, I don't think I thought I was going to amount to much myself. Yeah. Um, and I certainly didn't get told I was going to amount to much, except from like my my dad. Your parents should always be telling you you'll be awesome, but um, just my my roots didn't I didn't do a lot for my leg up. You know, I did, I think I posted the video on Twitter of like outside my house I grew up in, it was a tiny little house in a super bad neighborhood. Um, most people that, most people that I knew from that neighborhood are in jail. Yeah. You know, they didn't, they just didn't make it. Um, and I'm super thankful of the thing, even the bad things that unfolded in my path that got me where I am today. But I remember being up there and man, I'm, I'm up here talking to Mark, Mark Zuckerberg about how I stole a bunch of people's information out of an Oracle database yeah, and work to get that fixed. And it's just like the, I'm constantly um, amazed at the opportunities and things that I've got to do. The places I've got to, to go in this field, uh, the friends I made, you, Chris Nickerson, yeah. um, you know, Rob Fuller, I mean, just all the people that I know that I just really, people whose opinions I value, whose friendships I value and all the opportunities I've had. Like, I don't, no many um fields where you could just excel like you can yeah I, the opportunities i, I, I completely mean, agree everywhere. i am very thankful to this game and this is kind of why i'm doing this you know sunday conversations and i i try to go ahead and speak and i'm i'm thankful i want to give back and this is why i try to mentor people because when we came in the game i didn't have like a mentor or there was blogs or things i could like read and and do the way it is now right it's like you get information overload now so it's it's too crazy much. yeah we had, hacking too much. Exposed. we had hacking exposed yep. and frack yep and yep. Uh, you can hang 2600 2600 and arguably not a lot there yeah um, yeah I, I i busted those out the other day for the kids and they're like these are kind of kind of lame i was like this is all we had it's like you had to figure it out um, yeah. and now there's more things than you can consume which yeah. Makes it weird. So, so I know this is a good segue, right? Talking about like getting jobs and, and we're living through a crazy time. Right. And a lot of people do not have that option to reach out to people. People are getting laid off left and right. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's sad in a way. And then you have to say, okay, I got to put my big boy pants on. I got to keep on continually 
focusing on growth and getting myself better. But what are you doing to focus more during this crazy time of COVID? And how are you growing technically during this time? Man, uh, you gave me this question. I'm probably still unprepared for it. Um, what have I been doing? I think because we, what I kind of talked about of like technologies at work and other things, really just forcing myself to have to learn things that there's no other book for, you know, the, the new database we're using or the technology stack we've, we've written in house or, or we're using or we bought. Um, for me, for COVID, it's been really work driven. And then what services we use at work that have forced me to learn new things. Um, I'd say the current challenge that I have now is this is, um, I'm also the manager for this team. So really balancing the IC work and the manager work has been really a challenge because I'm, I get really focused on whichever one I'm doing. And when whatever one I'm doing, the other thing very much suffers. So, and I bounce between the two, but if I'm in IC mode, don't ask me to update a Jira ticket or go to a meeting or care about some spreadsheet. Like I just don't, but then um, it can be a bit of a transition to transition back um, from one or the other. So Um, you, you were talking about like just learning something. What fascinates me and I love to get tips from people I speak to. What is your process on learning something that you don't know? What, what do you do specifically from A to Z? If, if you yeah. could bring that in. Um, it sounds boring. I, I read the documentation. Do you make I, notes? What's that? Do you make notes? Uh, how, how, how do you, when you read, let's go deep, right? So for, yeah. me, for instance, if I have a documentation that has a PDF, I take that document and put it into my iPad into note shelf, which allows me to write up and mark stuff and tag it. What yeah. do you do? Um, I just open sublime text and take notes. All right. <laughs> Ready? Most of mine is, mine is most of mine. And I think when we talk about some of the other topics later, it's experimentation and mm-hmm. experience. So um, it's whatever it is, I install it and just start messing with it. And I start with it on a, how should I use this? How does the documentation say as say I should use it? And then I start going. And usually while I'm installing it, I'm like, Oh, that's the default password. Let me make note of that. I can't change that. This is a weird default. Let me take note of that because, or you're expecting me to change this post install. Well, I know from my sysadmin days, no one's going to do that. So that's interesting. Let me put that over there. And then it's just to start to say, okay, how does this thing work? What are the defaults? Um, What can I do with it? Um, That's really my process. And a lot of it, and it's my, probably my whole career, it's been, what someone has put in front of me driven and then I take it further. So examples of that would be um, all the Oracle stuff, came mm-hmm. across it on a few pen tests, installed it, just started mucking with it, had people in my network that I could ask questions to, um, ask them questions. And then, you know, at the time was very active in like writing Metasploit modules and other things. So I, like most hackers, I don't like to do things manually more than a few times. And so if it's something I need to do over and over and over again, it's time to write. Uh, you know, at the, at the time it was time to write a, like that's what ox module. Uh, now I'd say I'd write a Python script or a go bin yeah. know, willing, um, program to do it. Most likely Python script. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's funny. I have the same process as well, where, um, I remember in 2018, I moved over to a team while I was at Intel. Um, and the Godfather, as I call him from UEFI, um, Vincent mm-hmm. Zimmer, he has uh, two books out. Right. And I was like, okay, I'm going to read both books from cover to cover, but I'm going to read it as a hacker. What is interesting there that I can go after that I could try to attack? What, what is interesting, write your notes and how do they have it implemented and how I would try to attack it from a hacker's mindset. Yep. So that's why I love the name of this, this show. (laughs) Um, That's what it is. And that's even going back to that interview thing, you, you are trying to tease that out in an interview um, but it really is uh, almost what's in your DNA. Yeah. There's just some people that are that do it, and then they. I just I receive a lot of personal joy in making things do things they're not supposed to do. Um, I, yeah. That's just it. Like that thing's not supposed to do that, and I made it do that. Like that's the best. Um, you're not supposed to be able to get a shell on this. I just did it. That's the best. <laughs> I just did um, it. I just I feel- did it, and so um, that's really hard to tease out of people. 
Um, you, you start to tease that out as you interact with them. Even you can go to school and read what they write or what they uh, write on their blogs or those other things. But yeah, that's my process. Yeah, and I love that. If there's a, I, I read a lot of books. Um, if there's a technology that has a book, I'll go buy it. Thankfully, I make enough money that not an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'll get, I'll get, get it for the Kindle. Um, Kindle makes it pretty easy to take notes, especially on the iPad. Take notes um, and then highlight things. And then you can also take notes on the things you highlight. And then that becomes a really good reference later. So, so side note on that, yeah. I would recommend to you and people out there, use ReadWise. ReadWise mm -hmm. um, integrates into Kindle and then takes out all of your highlights and brings it over to ReadWise. And that integrates into Notion or Rome Research, depending on the no application you use. And I find it really helpful. So read wise, a quick tip, read wise. So I feel like we came in the cybersecurity game at the same time. Uh, yeah, so. We met because of Joe McCraig and you mentioned them earlier. What has changed for you since you've entered the game? Oh. And over, mm. over the last 14 years, That's a good question. Um, what has changed? I mean, I mean, almost everything has changed. Yeah. It went from a community to a industry, right? At least for me, right? It was very small. When I first mm -hmm. came in, I believe um, the first DEF CON I went to, there was 600 or maybe 1,000 people, maybe 1,000 at Alexis oh, wow. What was your first DEF CON? DEF CON 8. Okay, my first one was ten, so you're a little ahead of me. Okay, so yeah, it was it was DefCon eight, um, and it was very small, right? There weren't vendors. I think the vendors were selling just T-shirts, right? And I I remember buying a book, Uber Hacker. It was released like in two thousand and three or something like that. I want to find it just to have it because that was the first like book that I read. But that's what I found. I, I at least for me, I found that. It was from knowing kind of DEF CON 8, 9, 10, like knowing kind of everyone to like going there and like now you go to DEF CON and it's like, dude, I'm happy I seen you. I probably probably won't see you for the rest yeah. of the weekend. Yeah. But, you know, if you have free time, let's go grab dinner. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. I think that's very on point. Um, DEF DEF CON used to be about spending time with the people I, I only saw. And now um, I think for a lot of years, I deprioritized seeing those people or, and, and to be just to be hundred percent candid at some point, I think at a point in my life, I got to where I, were these people cool enough to hang out with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone goes like minded, that. Right. And I think for me, it's the same thing. Who I give my energy to is to yeah. people I want to be around and like-minded individuals. Do I enjoy having conversations with you? Are we on that same frequency? Can we connect? And yeah. do I like being around you? Yeah. Right now, that's my focus when I'm out in Vegas. Is to who do I? Who haven't I seen that I want to see? And that's the focus over anything else. Mm. Um, is to re is to make those connections because those connections are really what have driven my happiness and my upward mobility in this field is one knowing who to ask when i'm stuck mm. you know knowing what people are good at and being and having the rapport that you could ask them questions has saved me many 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 times um and then and they, they've also been keys that, for me of getting better jobs because you know a recommendation from somebody that's trusted goes really far uh in this business so um not being a dick to people uh, being straight up, being honest about what you can and can't do, I think have been keys um, mm. to my success. Yeah, definitely. You know, talking about people, I haven't, I think his, his name is MC. You did the talk yeah. with MC. What, I, just quick side note, sorry to off track, but it popped into my head when you did the talk in black with, with him and black hat. I don't recall when, but it was on the Oracle stuff. Yeah. Well, what's going on with him? I is haven't it, talked to him in a long time. I think he's still time? doing the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Side note. Yeah. Some so, people, I mean, um, and talking about what's changed. I mean, I think some people have gotten, um, he was in, I think even way before us. So yeah, that scene was even more intimate, I think. And so I think that it, things have changed a lot. It's, 
more commercialized it's business um it's more egotistic it can't I mean, say it, I mean put all those like it can be right it's not always and that's not a rule but um it can be more egotistical and more about the money if, if I had to put one thing on what has changed in the business in the decade plus that I've been doing it it became less about hacking and more about the money mm. and I like money there's money afford you opportunities to do lots of things and to have nice stuff. Um, it, hacking is, I think, what brought most of us to that, that curiosity and that that wanting to... The love of the game. I yeah, think... the love of the game, to do the things that no one else can do. Like, we're superheroes in a way, or we used yeah. to be. I, I, I um, always say we're mental athletes, yeah. and we do it on a professional level. We're like the LeBron James of the world of, of hacking, right? Wherever... However you want to look at it, that's how I, I basically yeah, call I wouldn't put everything. myself into that category. I'm, but I'm just saying, what, I mean, there we're NBA are. players or MLB players in, yeah. in this realm. And you're right. I think the money has changed it. But what I always tell people, especially trying to mentor them or yeah. even, you know, when they're new in the game, I'm like, just have the passion, have the love. I promise you, as you get better and you love it, the money will come. You it that is come. 100% right. Don't worry about the money. I understand if you're struggling right now, trust the process. Yep. Just trust the process and grind and learn the pain. When you hit that pain threshold, how do you push through to get to that next level and understand where that pain threshold is and how do you push through it? And yep. then you, you'll just get better. And I know I have a question for you on that, but... Let's cut to the chase. And you started a blog in 2007. How have you kept up with the latest and greatest research? And it's been going on 13 years, dude. Yeah. Um, I don't post nearly as often as I like. Um, you know what the big change for me in, on post, fr post frequency was um, when I switched from being a consultant and I had a new client every week mm -hmm. to being internal. And mm. then if I talked about something new I was researching, there's a pretty good bet that it was where I worked. And I remember when this happened because um, I was at Facebook and I tweeted something about some um, privilege, privilege escalation. So this is a long time ago. It's not a big deal anymore, but it was a privilege escalation that had come out and I tweeted something about that. And somebody replied, Oh, you must something about work being vulnerable to that. And my boss like took me to the side and was like, a little above the risk level he was super cool he's like just need to be <laughs> cognizant <laughs> of uh what you're putting out there and the people that are trying to to break in this place yeah because like knowing that the whole facebook fleet is vulnerable to this privesk probably not the best thing to put out on the internet mm -hmm. uh, until it's patched that's what that was the moment that it actually really changed my frequency of posting mm -hmm. i had to be sure that whatever i was talking about was fixed or didn't apply to work. And because I get really into what I'm doing at work, um, most of the time, um, things that I work on apply to work. So I'm guessing, like, I'm guessing in 2008, you were a consultant because you dropped 169 posts in 2008, which is an average of 14 posts a month. Let's break yeah. that down. That's almost four posts a week. Yeah, they're not all me though. I always did try to encourage and recruit other people to give to make posts. I think I have the majority of them, but I did over the years get some amazing people to write blog posts on that blog with me. Um, so they may not all be mine. Okay. Um, but that was, I was new, I was learning. And I think everyone, when they start, just the passion. And I wanted to share what I knew. So, how, why I started that blog was, there was so many things coming in that was my place to take notes. And then I started to find that people were also using my notes and nice. that incentivized me to keep to writing continue. those notes as, as I learned things. And um, everyone that is watching out there, go ahead. If you're on YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, write your questions down. I'm looking at the chats. I will ask CG and, and you'll get your questions answered as well. So go ahead I will let you know once you, once you, uh, write your questions, if you don't mind, I will call your name. 
out and then read the questions to Chris Gates. So it is, yeah, that, that for me at least was, was insane seeing all of those posts. You know, what I respect the most is that you're still posting, you know, this year you did three, you said you weren't posting as much, but you continue to go ahead and, and write these posts. What, what is that? motivation i know you're working but what continues like for, well, in your mind to continue to push out content yeah but we were talking about this before um over the course of my career i've started to understand like my there's a buddhist concept of dharma and that's like what you're here to do mm -hmm. and mine is teacher and guide and so mm. once i understood that i started to understand the internal motivation to put that information out there mm -hmm. um so yeah that's what keeps motivating me is I want other people to learn from what I've learned and make it easier for people. Because if I've if I've had to dig through documentation and spend days and days or hours and hours figuring something out, um, I would love to help someone shortcut that process. Or, and even better, go further than I went and find cooler stuff. Mm. Um, and that happens a lot. Like you find one thing. Um, not that I, I'm not trying to say that I'm finding all this all this unique stuff, but on at least one occasion, my post has encouraged other people to go take it even further than I could. And, mm. th and then they share that. And that's, that's amazing. That's how this community gets better and better. It's because you look at that and you're like, oh, that's interesting. What about this? Because you have your unique view and your unique experience into that topic. And then you can just take it a whole nother way and really get into that. Um, so I love that. I, I really get a lot of joy out of someone taking something that I've done or said or mentioned and taking it further, or it's just improved how they did it work. Like they got into this thing because they read some posts. I mean, it fills me with absolute joy. I don't know. Like most of the stuff's kind of dated at this point. I don't know if I get that many DMS anymore about that, but I used to get them all the time. Hey man, I used your blog and it helped me on this pen test. And I'm like, that is awesome. When people would tell <laughs> me, Hey, I'm working through this and I would give them suggestions. I'm like, just let me know how it went, man. I just want to know that you got in. Yeah. Um, and that I brings have, me a lot of joy. I have a question from Rob Fuller. Oh, man. What's the hardest part of transitioning from in the weeds to managing a team? Great question, Rob. That's Mubix for everyone that's, that's yeah. on Periscope. Uh, the hardest part is planning and vision. Mm. Thinking past the current engagement or understanding why the current engagement matters mm. and prioritizing, right? So like, say you've got a hundred things to look at, which one do you do first? Awesome. He has a as a consultant, you just do whatever your boss told you to do. <laughs> but as the manager, you've got to be like, okay, let me, of a hundred things to look at, let's pick the handful that are the most important and be able to articulate why they do they're the most important. He has and, a follow-up question, by the way, what is your favorite blog post that you have written over the course of your career? Uh, I was going to say one of his, um, oh. I don't know, man. Um, there's a lot. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> Can I reply later? I'd have right. to, honestly, I'd have to go look. So my um, next question that I have, <laughs> We'll come back to that. So I'll let you think on that. But my next That's question okay. deals with um, Rob, you know, and, and you, which is you've guys built Nova hackers, I believe in 2013 or 14. Can you tell me what was the idea behind it? Yeah, uh, man, this is a good, good one. Um, it was super, super selfish. We're in, we were both in Northern Virginia. There's a ton of amazing people in Northern Virginia that I didn't know. And I wanted to know them. Mm. Um, part one. The other part two is I went to, um, Richard Bailick used to run Nova Sec, I think it was called at the time. And he ran that. And then there, um, the OWASP groups are there. And it was really, I went, I went to all those meetings. I, I went to a few meetings at each of those groups and they were good groups. But what really struck me was the very transaction oriented event. Like go in, someone spews info at you, you eat pizza and you leave. 
Mm-hmm. There's really not a chance to get to know those people. I didn't know anybody in that group and I didn't, um, they weren't, you weren't really afforded an opportunity to do that. And mm-hmm. believe it or not, I'm pretty introverted, especially when I was coming up, like, um, who, who am I to come talk to this person? That's fucking awesome. Right. Like who am I to go talk to Dan Kaminsky or talk to any of these people that are really, you know, the rock stars mm-hmm. at that time, um, to, to, you know, to go do that. And so, um, met Rob and then we, we wanted just to have this group. And so we started meeting at, um, I think we're having lunch, Crystal city. And it just, you know, I think we found there was just a bunch of people that wanted also to do that. And then, um, there was the Austin Hackers Association model, which was like you had to, and I think HD and Drew and all those people from Metasploit were there and that, that amazing hacking scene they have down there. And they were talking about how you had, if you wanted to come to the meeting, you had to speak. Mm-hmm. And that just, I loved it, that I had to bring something to that because we, you know, you could just go to these meetings and never speak. And you're yeah. just, you're just sitting there. You're, you're consuming, but you're not giving out. In retrospect, understanding more about who I am internally, I can, I makes more sense that I want more people to give that out. Right. Because that's what I, I receive joy doing that. Now I do have to acknowledge that a lot of people don't receive joy doing that, but that was some of the reasons I think that we wanted to start that. Um, and now we have this amazing, amazing community. Um, I would, again, wouldn't be where I am today without that. Community. Yeah. I met, I met some of, uh, my closest friends in the hacker community at Nova Hackers, right? Jonathan, um, really Chris Nickerson and I became close during, I think you had like a, a one day conference, I believe. Yeah. Rob was, runs, uh, Rob would run a conference every year. Yeah. Uh, it was like a one day and, yeah, and right Chris was time. in, in town for that. And man, we had such a good conversation. And then he put me on to, I'll never forget this because it changed my life and I understand why he had in his backpack three different headphones. And I'm like, why do you roll it? Why? (laughs) And then he broke it down and it made so, so much sense to me that now like I roll around with like $300 headsets and I, I understand why now, you know, there's, there's one right there as well. So I mean, one one day I, I want him to write like a, a blog post on headphones because he is the king of headphones and, and speakers and music and how it really um, drives the inside hacker energy vibe yeah. in you. So I, yeah, thank for you sure. for that. Thank you for um, just creating Nova Hackers. How did you get into red teaming? I know you went into it in, in the army, but like when was it that you really took it serious and and went down that path? Yeah. So, um, that's funny. So, um, at, um, at West point, your final year, they, it's the equivalent of CCDC, but it's the cyber defense exercise, which is all the military academies. Mm -hmm. So my story for like hacking was, um, I went to DEF CON as a cadet and that's where I had that light bulb go off. And the story I tell is I'm sitting on that hot ass tent on the top of the Alexis park. Mm -hmm. Um, Bruce Potter was talking about cracking web. Jeremiah Grossman was talking about this weird thing called cross-site scripting. Um, and I was like, this is where I want to be. And just all the people and the, um, the CTF was going and it had Domocon running around and developers, developers, developers. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget that. Like yeah. that, that trip, I mean, just changed my life. This is Bang. like the people that I wanted to be, uh, to be around. Um, and there was this guy that was posting on it's the 53 list. So it's a um, 53 is um, one of the army designations for like one of the IT systems things. So um, there's this guy, Joe McCray talking about running root wars. <clears throat> and I was like, what the hell is a root war? And just started talking to this guy. Um, and he was my, really my first like hacking mentor. We may, I, I don't, I may have already lost track of the question, but um how did you get into uh, how did teaming? I get into red teaming? Um, so yeah, I started with that and was doing the root wars and just like hacking stuff. And it was, um, so the cyber defense exercise is what got me into like, wow, there's this, all this crazy stuff to do. This is amazing. I love this. Um, and then it was be like, how do I, how can I do this for work? And it was really my work. You know, it was really all on the side. I took some security classes in the army, um, but it was mostly like sysadmin work, layer two, layer three stuff that I did. 
Um, when I was an S6 at this unit in El Paso, which is like the battalion communications officer, basically uh, the IT manager, if you will, in, in you know, normal speak, um, I was also responsible for security. And so it was just something that was, I was interested in. And then uh, my work there and just the studying I have done and the, like the courses I wrote there, um, it convinced uh, this guy, Vince, an MC, it was actually MC's recommendation that pushed me through. Uh, and that was from Joe and working with him on Root Wars. Gave, let him take a, take a chance on this guy that had no experience doing this mm. aside from like burn security alone. So that was my first red team. That was Army Red Team. That's 2008. Um, that was before everyone was fishing on engagements. Um, you know, we were, you know, getting the networks and staying there for a while. And the, the concept, like, the concept of like implants and things and like having a backdoor that stayed somewhere for a while, like I'd have to go like crack open the Hacking Exposed book, but I don't feel like that was really talked about in the way that it is now. Yeah. Um, so that was really my, my, my entrance into that. And also the concept of using physical security people to like go in and put, you know, um, con, con boot the computer, put your back door on the computer for when the next morning, when they came in and logged into work, you would get your shells and starting to understand uh, the intersection of, um, you know, those, you know, physical, social, and uh, electronic. Explain what does it take to get good at red teaming? Because a lot of people are getting, getting into the game, right? And they want to be a red team or blue team. But for you, what do you think it takes to get to that next level? I look at red teaming as becoming a master mechanic. Um, you start learning how some certain wrench or tool works. And red teaming is about understanding which wrench, what set of tools I need to put in my box for this engagement, and then how to use each one of those in a very precise manner. Um, it's all experience. I, I wish I had a better answer, like a faster answer for somebody, but um, it's experience. Like you just, because you come across things in training. So like, and you're gonna, and you're gonna, fa and failing, failing a lot. Um, my, my biggest lessons have come, my biggest red teaming lessons have come from Chris Nickerson, who is just one of the most amazing people on this planet. Um, but I remember more than once, I would be trying to do something and failing. And I would, I'd be like, man, I'm stuck here. And he'd be like, hmm, well, did you try this? And I learned later that he had already done whatever thing that he suggested, but he would just calmly ask, did you try this thing? And now I've looked bad because I didn't try that or I skipped that port or I just didn't do that. <laughs> um, and, but that's where the experience comes in of like, hmm, I now, you know, I'm always gonna like, I, you're on a network, you plug in, you can't get a DHCP address. What do you do? How about you run Wireshark, see what's on the network, right? <laughs> and I remember we had broke into this building, I'm on this laptop, I'm not getting a DHCP address and I have to like text him like, I can't get a DHC address. He's like, well, you ran Wireshark and just looked to see what was on the network, right? You know, crickets. Hello. Uh, yep, totally did that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had a few moments like that of where I've just like got my ass handed to me and thankfully had um, a partner in crime with that that didn't give me the you sucks and rather just guided me to do better and then expected me to know that answer next time. Um, but that's where the experience comes in. It's like, it's getting caught. It's failing. It's go, like breaking into buildings. It's like getting caught trying to break into a building and having to like turn around or run or, you know, Just or talk your way out of it because, you know, I didn't want to go back to the car with Eric and Chris sitting there and have to say I failed. I was like, I'm going to get in this damn building because I don't want to have to go back and try again. I, don't, <laughs> I didn't do it. That, that, um, so that's a good motivation. Yeah, failing. that's a good segue into who has mentored you during your career? And, and we went over Joe as well yeah. as Chris and Nickerson and Eric. Yep. I mean, the, the biggest person that I can attribute to my success is Joe McRae. Wow. That guy is an absolute saint. Uh, he has the patience of the most patient uh, of a monk. Like he, just thinking about just the just dumbass questions I asked that man <laughs> as I was learning and his patience to just guide me through that, um, I am forever indebted to that guy mm. for everything he did for me. Um, wow. So, number one, um, 
Vince um, from the U.S. Army Red Team. I don't know if he's, I don't want to say his last name, but if he ever listens, I'll know it's him. Um, really, all the people on Army Red Team, um, InfoSec Janitor, um, and then uh, basically every person, every place I've worked, I've had someone that's been key to my next success. Um, and now my biggest mentors now are people like Rob, Rob Fuller, who have surpassed me uh, in technical ability uh, mm -hmm. in many, many ways. And now um, they mentor me. And I mm -hmm. think that's, there's beauty in that of like, there was a time where I was mentoring him and now mm -hmm. he mentors me all the time. And then occasionally we mentor each other because, you know, mm -hmm. the cool thing about getting old is you occasionally know some stuff from experience that other people don't know. And you can drop that knowledge on him. Like, hey man, I remember I did this like 10 years ago. That probably works. Um, especially like DevOps and cloud because all that stuff is, is coming around again. So all those tricks from like the late 2000s start to work again. Um, because we've done away with all those protections. I always believe the teacher eventually becomes the student. Yeah. I think if you're doing it right. Yeah. And yeah. I think one of, I always give this example, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are or how long you've been in a game. I believe you always have, you need that growth mindset. Yeah. And right now for like, I, I, on Saturdays and Sundays, I do bug bounty and I have a 19 year old. That is like schooling me. Nice. Like, this yeah. is what you need to do. This is how you have to do it. Santiago Lopez, shout out to him. He nice. is a, a gangster when it comes to like bug bounties made over a million dollars with um, not bug crowd hacker one. And he has the patience and, and it's like, Hey, he points me in a direction. I don't ask questions. I'm like, I got you. I'll come back. Right. Cause I know yeah. the process, the process is work your ass off. That's yeah. the process. There's no substitution for that. Work your ass off. And then when you hit that threshold of pain and you pass <laughs> through it and you get that knowledge, you yep. go back to your mentor and I done finished that. Yep. I finished it. Next. Yeah, there's so many there's I mean there's more I mean HC War, Egypt. I mean yeah. it's just Yeah. It's any, on and any on person and on. that's any person that's taken a few minutes to answer my dumbass questions yeah. has been a mentor to and, me. And and for me, and when I was, I, I said this last week for the people that are viewing, and I will say this every single time. When you have an opportunity and you're going to come face to face with a potential mentor or someone you want to have or you have a question for, prep it. Be prepared. You might not ever get that opportunity again. And yeah. that's what I did in my career, like DEF CON after I think it was like DEF CON 11, I started to be way more strategic on how do I cut, you know, how do I take a shortcut to get better? Right. Yeah. And I knew I wanted to go to this talk. So I used to look up like this certain person and what he's talking about, what he's researching because it interests me. And when I have the opportunity, be very strategic, look for this guy ask him the question that you wrote down before even like approaching him. And that's, and, yeah. and that shows an interest to that person that you were listening and you, you know, you, you said, all right, I'm going to take time out to go ahead and, and learn from that person. And in return, hopefully that person will give you the shortcut that you want. I think, I think you nailed it. I think the key and uh, the key to like getting, getting a mentor or even getting a good question answered is asking the good question, mm. preparing that question. Um, I've had a lot of people, will you mentor me? Sure. Or, sure. What do you want to know? Yeah. And if you can't tell me what you want to know next, I can't tell you how to be me. My, my, mm. my path is, do you want to go join the army and get, get your body all tore up and you know, like yeah. my path is my path. It's not anybody else's. What I can answer is questions and, or I want to know about this. I want to know about Oracle. I want to know about Bitcoin. I want to know about this. Those are the questions that can be answered. Mm -hmm. When someone's like, will you teach me how to do hack, how to hack or will you teach me how to just be better? Like I, I can't teach you how yeah. to be better. I need you to come at me with a question be more strategic. What advice can you give viewers on finding a mentor? 
I think you 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 just gave the best advice, which is like, who's doing stuff that you're interested in, or who who is where you think you want to be? And I was very very careful where you think you want to be because you mm-hmm. may you may find you don't want to be, be that person yeah. as you start progressing down that route. But who do you admire? Who's dropping the knowledge that you want to know? Who has the things that you want to have? Who has the X, you know, dollar sign X, variable X that you want to be? Um, and then ask what's the next, I'm here, lay it out for them so they know where you're at. How do I get to the next level? That's a question that someone could actually spend 15, 20, 30 minutes and give you an answer. And it can be a, it can be a worthwhile exchange for both of you. Um, if you don't do that, and then the second piece of that of maybe keeping a mentor is doing the work. I've had a ton of people mm. that just don't want to, one, they think they know the answer, so I don't know why you asked me the question. You know the answer, don't ask my, don't waste my time, I don't ask the question. Yeah. Or if you don't like my answer, understand all my answers are suggestions and you don't have to do them, they're just really what works for me. But two, do the work. Most of the people that I that have wanted to come to me for mentoring didn't want to do the work. Yeah. If you don't do the work, I'm not going to invest my time. I'm super busy, just like everybody else. If I, I will, I will spend the time to to grow, help someone grow. But you got to do the work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what I found, like when I try to mentor people, I find eight out of ten people just fall off because yeah. they don't want to do the work. And I'm like, there is zero substitution for not. It, it's just not. You have to put in that time. You have to get better. You're not going to cheat your way to to success. It's like you have to put in those hours day in and day out. Yep. Uh, and I, the, the analogy I use now, I didn't use it then, but I use now is meditation. You can read a million meditation books, but until you start putting the minutes into meditation, mm-hmm. You're not going to get the value. You're not going to understand the process. It's the same thing for breaking into anything else. You have to put the time in. You could read a million books and it doesn't teach you how to actually do it. And it doesn't help you how to do it when the one command didn't work. Mm. Um, I so read, you, yeah, I've read a few tweets that you've sent out there into uh, a certain type of meditation and focusing on oneself can you go into what you've been doing with that because it does interest me because i i am a a person that meditates and i believe in positivity and positive energy and i see you perking up there go for it yeah oh man um clear your calendar um go for it (laughs) we're here we're here um i think for a lot of years uh i or I gave it in my hacking your happiness talk. I realized that I was at DEF CON surrounded by a ton of friends and I was the loneliest I had ever been. And I didn't want to be here anymore. Mm. And um, hitting rock bottom helped me understand that I needed to do something different. Mm. Um, so I've really spent a lot of time, probably since 2016 or 2017, um, on mindfulness and understanding. Um, my place on this planet and then how to be less miserable. Um, and I've really been applying my hacker mindset to these topics because there's not really much, it, the analogy I came up with in that talk and what I still carry on with is, you know, the reality that we're operating in is a system and mm-hmm. um, it has rules and it has rules that can also be bent and moved around and they're not hard and fast and hackers are the best group of people to um, start to manipulate and change and bend those rules that's what we do every day we do it in systems we do it in code Um, there's really no difference between doing it in a computer network and doing it for our physical reality Um, and so part of that is mindfulness and positivity and energy and understanding um, you know, the concept of like the things I think about and the attitude I take toward things or what comes back to me. Um, if I'm negative on something, I'm expecting a negative outcome of a situation. Nine times out of 10, I'm going to get a negative outcome of a situation. Mm-hmm. Where if I have a positive outcome, like nine times out of 10, I'm going to get a positive outcome. So you yeah. start to understand like there's these things in the system, they're like bits that you can flip and you, you're actually the master of that switch, right? 
you know, Marco, you're not holding my switch and I'm not holding yours. Like I control my switch. It's right here. It's internal to me. I can flip that switch and start to make things change or just to start to feel different. And when you start to feel different about a topic, everything around you and that topic starts to change. Yeah. That's really the magic. And that's really like the core, core exploit, if you will, of that is how I feel about it is how is my take on it and my perception of it. Mm. I, I, I want to go into this because you said I hit rock bottom, you know, people on the outside that don't know you or that don't know that. I don't know if you want to get into that. What was that? Right. What, what made you hit that rock bottom? And I, I don't know what, what made me hit, hit that. Um, well, all right. At the time, <laughs> I didn't know what made me hit that. Uh, from the outward perspective, I had it. I had it all. I was making tons of money. Yeah. Uh, great career. I've been in. Have a. I have a LinkedIn resume that, that people would kill for. Um, but I was. I was empty inside, and I have. You know, I have a wife and three kids, and I felt alone in my life. I felt alone, even though I was surrounded by people, and. Um, it just eventually hit me that just I wasn't happy and um, I, I didn't get so bad that I wanted to kill myself. But if someone had done it for me or if I had had an auto accident, I would have been OK with it. And mm. eventually I was like, man, this is not how I want to be. And I started seeking help for that. And my help for that came. All right, we're going to get we're going to get down in the weird, weird weeds here. Go for it. Uh, um I watched this video by Dolores Cannon and she's a, a hypnotherapist. She's passed away now, but she's, um, she was talking in this video and it was down a YouTube rabbit hole of like, sometimes the reasons you're having problems in your current life has to do with things that happened in your past lives. And I was like, what is that? What was past lives? So I had read Castaneda and things in high school it was kind of like sort of into mindfulness. And then in my military time, it kind of dropped off of that. Yeah. And so I was like, what is, what is, um, what is past life aggression? What is hypnotherapy? So I found this person that was kind of in Northern Virginia and I went and saw them and, um, it was my second session with them that I really started. I, I got an insight into, um, the best way I can explain it is just feeling connected to whatever higher power that you believe in. And, I think hum the human condition allows us to forget that we came from that. Like, you know, insert, insert your religion into that. Yeah. But my, my belief and my, my experience and my study has taught me to believe that um, we all come from, from God. We are a piece of God incarnate and we have that connection back to that at all times. Mm -hmm. The way we live our lives now in, in just in this current society Mm. we have forgotten that connection and mm. we begin to feel alone. And that, that second session was my turning point um, of not feeling alone anymore. Mm. Um, this is, that, I, I tell you this because it's very, very important to dive deep into this because a lot of people during this time is going through it, right? You're isolated, you're quarantined, you feel alone or potentially you're making different moves. Life has changed. Right. And this topic is very important. And I want to dig into that. Right. Yeah. What was that? What was yeah, that me, for you? Let me, let me add the medical caveat there. Go for <laughs> Cause it. I'm sure it's coming. Um, I did go see the doctor and I did have it prepped to go get on antidepressants and counseling and all that other stuff. And what I had decided was I was going to, I had had this unexpected, like $300. I got it from a bug bounty. And I was like, I'm going to spend this money on these sessions. And if I'm not feeling any different, I'm just going to go the traditional route. Um, but it, it was that it was that second session that actually yeah. kind of kicked me off and took me down this path. Um, and so I ended up not needing to do the medical route. But people should totally do that if they feel that's what they need. To and do. It, it's I, funny because <clears throat> you know we've known each other for a long time, and around the I want to say 2015 or. Yeah, 2014, 2015, I seen you at um, ShmooCon, and I just felt a different energy. A mm. d j it was just different. It, w it was different. It was, I can't explain it. You know, you, you're around someone so long, and you know that person, and then you go around them, and you're like, huh, 
something something's not it wasn't that it wasn't right it was just not chris yeah right the engagement I was, um, wasn't yeah there. i was empty inside and because i had no other way of knowing how to cope with that i i tried to cope with um changing jobs because mm -hmm. i didn't understand that how mm -hmm. i feel about something is how i feel about it mm -hmm. and external things are external things so i kept changing my external circumstances hoping mm -hmm. that i would feel better inside and i would reset the clock for six months and then i would start feeling the same you know six months later and uh, I, I also filled it with alcohol and drugs because i didn't want to feel that way anymore yeah, yeah. and that's the perfect escape is to to sure. use alcohol and drugs um and so that worked for a while until it doesn't <laughs> um so uh, yeah okay that this is a great segue into what what you made that change you spent that money to to go ahead and get help right because yeah. what i found what i find the most a lot of times in the community you don't you don't really speak about taking what you feel inside sharing it right being vulnerable yeah. and everybody is secluded but you see the hate on on Twitter or something like that. Like, I'm like, you have pain in you. Why? A lot of people have pain in them and we are not educated on how to deal with that pain. Um, and the, the, I think the saying in a lot of fields is hurt people, hurt people. And that's what I did. I hurt people. I hurt mm -hmm. my family. I hurt my friends. I hurt strangers. Okay. You know, so I was just mean. So um, you, you switch jobs. Yeah. How did you, okay. And that was taken care of for a while. Yeah. How did you deal with your family? Because now in COVID, we're home, mm. we're working from home. You have to interact with the family. How do you? How? What did you do? Was what pain was there? What was there? A lot of arguing. How did you deal with that? Because now pre COVID or now COVID, like well, now pre COVID when you were going through it, when you were going uh -oh. through it, twenty sixteen. Oh, I mean, we were. Um, I was on the verge of a divorce. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, on the verge of divorce. Um, my wife didn't know how to help me. Um, I'm not sure I was in a place to receive the help. Um, but yeah, eventually, you know, I saw it, I saw it, um, non traditional counseling mm -hmm. and doing energy work. So Reiki and some of the other modalities are what started to help me mm. and uh, grabbing some people and really starting to understand. I did some, a, a lot of coaching uh, with this guy, Rob uh, Pritchard. He runs the Healing Frequency here in Virginia. He's amazing. And I did a lot of coaching with him to really understand that my, my heart had been closed. All the, all the stuff that happened to me in my life, like I wasn't in a position to let anybody in anymore. Mm. So I had gotten, my heart had gotten so hard. And I had just decided along the way, you know, because my mom left when I was a kid and that really damaged me. And I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. We eventually worked through like, a lot of the damage that my, my parents getting divorced as a kid did to me, you know, just it's the same stuff that happens to everybody. It's everyone's life journey is to have all this pretty horrible shit happen to them. And for you to figure out how to work through that and use that to grow and actually still be able to love someone. Because just because like I had this girlfriend that cheated on me with everybody in high school, that doesn't mean that my wife was going to do that to me. That yeah. doesn't mean that the girlfriend after her is going to do that. Mm -hmm. That person is that person. And those are the choices they made. But what, ha what can happen is your brain starts to say, well, that person hurt me and I've had three people hurt me in a row. That means number four is going to hurt me. And rather than let number four hurt me, I'm going to hurt them first or I'm not going to let them in enough to do that. And yeah. after enough of those times, I had gotten to the point where I didn't want to let anybody in. Mm. And that energy work, so Reiki, and people probably might heard me talk about that. What's Reiki? What are these other modalities? But through Reiki, it was all self-work and working with practitioners that really helped me unlock some of that and start to understand and work through the counseling to, to bring up those issues in like your traditional kind of therapy way and then use the energy work to kind of dissipate and let, let go of that stuff. Okay. I really uh, want you to go. About. I really want you to go deep in energy work. Okay. When you say energy work, what do you mean? What techniques? What hmm. are you doing? I want long form. Give okay, me five thank you. minutes. I tend to talk deep. about that and people don't know what the hell I'm saying. Um, there's a concept that we're all energy. We're all molecules. We're all yep. moving and that we vibrate at a certain frequency. So when you hear people say raise your vibration or whatever, you know, we vibrate at a certain frequency and we feel solid. Like this table, this wall, the wall behind me, 
it's solid because it's vibrating at a certain frequency. If you apply heat to that wall, it no longer becomes solid, right? It starts to get hot and kind of bendy, eventually catches on fire and turns into something else and transforms. Um, we are all energy, we're all interconnected. Quantum, quantum physics will, will have done experiments to show you these things. More importantly, for me, I get asked, is this stuff real all the time? And I, my answer to that now is yeah. go have experience in energy work. Go mm -hmm. take a Reiki class, go um, have Reiki. I, I think I was telling you, I'll be happy to give a session for you because yeah. I love turning people that don't believe in this into, the, into this. But the idea is to do it many, many, many times, just like you do with all your hacker stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You don't get a shell one time and, you know, get on Twitter and say, I found this O-Day. No, nope, you do it a million times. You write the exploit. You meticulously figure these things out through experimentation, documentation, and experience. Mm. Um, you know, you, you arrive at how you feel about these things. So energy work is the idea of we're all connected. That's That concept has been around. It's in basically every religion. Yep. And the idea is um, you, the practitioner can serve as a conduit to allow that energy connection to be felt in a more strong way. Um, does that help? I mean, it's kind of no, like... No, it, it, it definitely does help. And, and for me... It's a little bit know, of a weird esoteric topic because most people haven't been taught this or talked about it. It's I, weird woo-woo shit. No, um, I don't... I don't I, listen, I think... I know you're down with it, but I think some people in general, I've had some interactions on Twitter where people are like, oh, I thought better of you, Gates, because you're into this, <laughs> this fantasy see, land stuff. Like, and it's like, I've arrived at this because I've done, I've done over 300 Reiki sessions mm. as a practitioner. So I've done mm. 300 sessions. I worked on people in hospice. I worked on people at the hospital. Mm. I worked on clients. I've worked on shares. And it's only through over 300 sessions that I've arrived to feel so strongly on the topic. Yeah. I was I, very much a skeptic um, on the topic. I, yeah. I, to be honest, I love that. Right. One of the things for me is I don't give a shit what people think about me. Like I know who I am. So if I believe in something, I believe in it. Right. I think what changed, there's two things that changed my life completely for the positive and having a positive mindset every single day. I wake up and say, thank God my heart didn't take a break. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's gratitude. positivity. Like one on one is an amazing thing. I'm like, thank you heart for not stopping. Right. And I think when you put yourself in a position to win, so I, I'll never forget this. You know, I was like, look, I came home from school. I'm back in the Bronx. And the one thing I said is like, I want to get out of the hood. That's yeah. the one goal I have for myself. I don't want to be in the hood anymore. First thing I did first paycheck. I worked at home Depot 2003. Hold on one second. Oh, I have my paycheck right next to me, but it has my social on it. Mm. I need to black it out, but I have it here to remind me of where I came from and where I never want to go back. I have it framed and everything. That's right? awesome. The thing is with the first paycheck, I bought Anthony Robbins. I was like, I need to get into a positive mindset. Yep. One, two, I never forget. My brother came home with a CD and he gave it to me. He's like, they're passing this around in, in, um, at work. It's like thinking different. And it was, um, the secret. And I seen the oh, secret yeah. and I was oh, like, Oh man, I didn't know you were down with all that. Hell yeah. That's awesome. I was like, what? Okay. Dude, that's hacking. I mean, yeah. That law of attraction is hacking. It's straight it's up. real. When I tell you it's so real, I'll give yes. you and and guys, add add your questions cuz we're getting to some more questions. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to give you we're going off topic a little bit, but I'm going to give you my story on why I know for a fact Let's do it, that the man. law of attraction works. I was working in 2006 Yes, 2006 at Mercedes, 2005 Mercedes Benz. I wanted to get a car. I had this Audi TT. I loved it. I was like, that's a fake Porsche. I put it on my desktop. Always had it there for like seven months. I finally saved up a little bit of money. First car. I never had a car. I was like, I think I have enough. I'm going to go out and get it. So I, I went to my friend, got this discount code for Mercedes, which is owned by Chrysler. So that discount works. So I'm like, I'm going to go ahead and buy this um, 
Chrysler because I need a car. I go out. I drive to this place on a Saturday. I make a left turn like over the bridge, 30 minutes out. I make a left turn into a wrong dealership. When I go in in there, the week before, by the way, I had a Super Bowl party and told my friend my dream car. Right? So anyway, I make a left, go into a wrong dealership. I go in there and like, hey, I have this discount code. And they're like, oh, you want to go to the next dealership, which is down the block. And when I would look to my left, it's my friend. He's working there. He then goes and says, hey, remember the conversation we were having? I have it right here. Just came in the day before yesterday. Nice. I told him if I could walk out with it today, I'm taking it home. That day I was the owner of the Audi TT. So this is how I come I know that that works right that positivity that mindset and I don't care I, I I've lived it when it you work, see man. something when you see something yourself and you know it works and it is you you know I don't have to tell someone else that God exists I know in myself it exists so this is why I, I when you talk about energy and you know just that positive mindset it is so important so you already understand it because all you're doing for law of attraction is just sending that, that out. That's energy. Our thoughts are energy, yeah. right? They're electro, they're electro, not magnetic. Your heart is electromagnetic. They're electrochemical, right? Yeah. They, they just go out and that's the same thing. The law of attraction is it's, it's energy. It's all about attracting those things that you want. I've had just about everything I've asked for has shown up. I make the amount of money that I wanted to make every time I've asked for more money in the next job is put me right at that number that I wanted. Do you, so. do you have a, a, a goal, you put it out there and then you say you give it a date? How does that, excuse me, how does oh, that work? Me? Um, it depends on the thing. Like some, some things, you know, I don't, I don't like to do hard dates and I don't like to say I have to get it this way. Um, some things are, um, you just put, I just put it out and then I just let the, at this point I have enough trust that it's going to happen that I just let it happen because um, I, I keep referring back to that hacking your happiness talk because I put a lot, a lot of my life lessons have come in that, but you know, the universe is always co uh, conspiring on your behalf to give you the things that you want. Mm. Sometimes getting the thing that you want means you didn't get the thing that you, that you thought you wanted. And the example I tell for that is, um, I tried to go work for this guy twice and both times the job fell through. And, um, eventually after that second time, I was like, well, for whatever reason, I'm just not supposed to be like linked up with this person. Yeah. And I had to just be okay with that. And then way, way better opportunities came along. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am today if I had gone down that path. Um, so, I do, so long answer to, you no, know, I don't always put dates. I just, uh, at this point, I under, I've studied the mechanics of that. And I've also studied the mechanics of how the other universal and natural laws work. And if, once you start to understand there's more to that law of attraction than just the law of attraction, um, you can just start, I just have faith that it will work. And it just does. Let's, let's get a little technical with it. All right. Is it a goal that you write and you meditate on it? What is the practices mm -hmm. that you use yeah, visualization that. every day, every day. So you visualize in result. So it's you in the car. It's uh, you with this uh, this object. It's you with this bank account. It's you in Florida. It's you wherever you want to be in result. And you just, I just focus on what I want to be, how I want to feel, how I'll be feeling when I mm -hmm. have that thing or having that experience. Um, the content, the joy in your heart the excitement in your body that you're doing that thing. You're like when you drive that car yeah. and you feel it, or when you, just when you have that state of joy, you, you, everyone has it. And I don't think we have them a lot all the time, but you have that state of joy and how you feel when you're yeah. in that complete state of joy, nothing else matters except for the moment that you're in and how happy you are. I think about that and I apply that feeling to that thing I want because it's just a mental state. I like that. Um, and your mind doesn't know the difference between something that's happening to you mm -hmm. in real time or, or memory. So yeah. you can start to trick your mind to say, oh, if you give it the same thing over and over again, 
that's the positive outcome, it just has to become true because your mind's putting that out there. What most of us do is we think about negative shit all day long, all the time. And what happens? You're getting the thing that you think about all the time, which yeah. is the negative thing. The bad things, that person's going to cheat on me. This thing's going to go wrong. The car's going to break down. Dog's going to piss on the floor, whatever. Um, when you focus on that all the time, it you becomes. get what you think about all the time. And so that's where meditation comes in is you want to notice when you're having the thoughts that you don't want to have, interrupt that. You set your, set your debugger, your breaking break point. Oh, bad thought, negative thought. Mm -hmm. Let's turn it and mm. swap that value out in the register and then let the program keep going in the new way with the new instructions. Um, and that's where how I approach meditation. Why I wanted to get good at meditation was to catch those negative thoughts and those negative beliefs in real time so I could do something about them. Nice. What, one of the things that I do is every night before going to sleep, I have one question to myself. Am I better than yesterday's Marco? And then from there... I plan my day the next day yep. ahead of time. And before I go to sleep or in the morning, I rehearse my day. I don't, I don't react to my day. I'm very proactive and I literally oh, close my eyes and rehearse my day on how it's going to go. One thing that I do calculate is what potentially might be a roadblock. And then I create a process around how I potentially might deal with that. And that's important to me because I know how to react and not be thrown off. And that has helped me over the last two years to create potential roadblocks of the day. So then it's, it's not a earthquake or a tremor. It's a speed bump. Yep. Because I've rehearsed that. what, how I'm going to react, what I'm going to do and tackle that and try to predict potential road bumps. And, but I specifically go ahead and put that positive energy out. This is how I want to react. This is how I want to create my day and be very intentional, very strategic every single day. Because then at the end of the day, I feel like today, cause I can't get it back, yeah. but I gave it all she got. Yeah, man. Well, and up, and, and that, be up on this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Know. And that's how you got that's, it. You got that it. is my game plan. And I am very strategic on that. As soon as I wake up, I do this 20, 20, 20 rule where I do 20 minutes of walking, 20 minutes of meditation, 20 minutes of reading and growing and looking over my my schedule for the day and, and rehearsing that. Right. And that's it. what I try to do. And not every day is is like awesome. But what I do is at the end, like before I ask that question, I journal, I do a retrospective of the day and how can I, can I like do better the next day? And I think 1% every day yeah. in creating those habits will take That's me like, to where I want to go. It's like someone's got that meme of like 1.001 1 .001 to the 365 is ends up being a lot by the end of the year, <laughs> right? Versus nothing at, um, if you don't do anything. So, so. W going back to when you went to go get that help, did you feel that immediately it, it changed you or was it over a course of time? And, and when you were going through that second part was like, how did you trust that process? Oh, ooh, great question. It did not happen immediately. Um, I had that one experience where I basically it stopped the get off the planet train um, and the rest of it came mm -hmm. really slowly. Like uh, I'm kind of dumb when it comes to learning some of these lessons. So I can be a slow learner at times. So it definitely wasn't fast. And I, um, my skeptical mind and my needing to have validation and proof um, really maybe, maybe slowed the process, but um, man, what's the question one more time? It was, it, it was, was, it was, was fast. when, when you went ahead and you, you went to go get the help, Yep. you know, did it, did it work the first three or four sessions? And I think what's more important, how did you go about entrusting the process that this will work and why, why, what was that? What in your mind said, I'm going to trust it. So I didn't, I didn't, what I, how, how I approached it was, um, 
it can't be any worse. So let me try these things. Mm. And I figured I could always go back to how I was. Ooh. I figured, I mean, that's maybe a little pessimistic, but I said, you know what, let me try these things. Let me put some effort into it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And the, what happened was it started to work and I start things started to improve slowly. I and mean, this has been a, like four, four or five year process at this point. Um, and I didn't, I mean, I didn't, I don't feel like I was better the next day by any means. Um, but what I did start to have is hope. And I did start to say, start looking forward to the next challenge, the next thing to learn and open up this. It's like finding out this, um, this new operating system list or this new thing, this new thing was presented to me. Mm. It had all these things to fuck with, mm. right? All these things to hack on. And I just started, okay, well, let's play with this for a while. And my, 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 my temperament is to really get deep into things. So I would get really deep into something um, and just to see how far it went. So at first that was um, hypnosis. And then it became um, what happens at, li- they have a hypnosis called life between lives. So like what mm-hmm. happens when they're on the other side, um, getting really interested in that. Uh, the energy work thing, like doing Reiki, because um, Reiki, you start with doing that on yourself. And I did that for 45 days after I learned it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was completely different than it so, after 45 days. Nice. So I want to dig deeper on the feeling. I know you said you hit rock bottom. And what I want to pull out, I want to pull on a string right now, because yeah. a lot of people that will watch this or will listen to this, Do not understand the feeling, right? One of the things I tell people is, are you excited or nervous? I said, because your body is the same feeling. So you don't, you can trick your mind to say, I'm excited about this rather than nervous. What in your body, what did you feel? Was it, I was exhausted all the time? Was I, what was it? What were those signs? Because I want to give the people that are listening the clues that they should go ahead and maybe reach out to you, maybe reach out to a different source rather than try to self-medicate with everything. Your mind was was despair. Can you go deeper? How I would, how I explain it to people was things were going pretty well in my Mm -hmm. whole life. I just, I was just waiting bracing for when it would stop going well and it was just the like i can't feel good about what's happening because it's as soon as i feel good about it it's gonna stop and so it was was a part of that when things were going you know well i was just waiting for them to not and just bracing for that impact um and the rest of the time when it was a little worse was just despair is that self-sabotage what's that is that self sabotage i think i do understand now that yes it was okay i didn't what understand was, it what was the time. feeling though i know i know you say despair what was it physically like mm-hmm. because i want people to recognize this and and not let it go right i want to know what the feeling was was it i didn't want to interact with someone i didn't want to hear something i was getting mad that someone tweeted about something what was it I need, I, I want to pull out an action. What does it feel? Because one thing that I would tell the listeners out there, when I'm stressed, one thing I know I'm stressed is I get on my left shoulder. It starts getting really tight mm. on my neck, on my shoulder, inside of like my chest. And trust me, I've been to doc, to the doctor about this and, and, and more than 15 times. Right. But what I've come down and I self self diagnosed because I am healthy, thank God. But I know, okay, I'm being stressed. I feel these these tightness. It's a nice tail. It's nice to know when you know your tail. Yeah, I know my tail. I'm very, very self aware because not only do I take notes on it, I'm like, check yourself. Right now, your neck is hurting and you know where that's going to go. And this is what I want to say is what was your tell? What was. What were you feeling back then? Oh, I just felt like I was carrying a heavy rucksack all the time. You were tired. Tired. Let's, let's, let's... Literally, there's something weighing me down and pushing me down. Um, so were you sleeping more? Know what it feels like were to you carry sleeping? Like, you're carrying like these 100-pound backpacks, and you just, you just can't get rid of it no matter what you do, and you know you just have miles and miles. Like, I felt like I had you know 40, 40 more years to carry this backpack. 
and well, I you just, were traveling you know, a lot as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's. I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't eating right. Um, I was, you know, medicating to make me not think about those things. Um, all so of that was a bunch of a bunch of things. Crap. So dependencies, yeah. traveling. You felt worn down. Were you sleeping? What was your sleeping yeah. habit? Hackers don't sleep, dude. I know that. Up all night, man. Sleeping. Give it. Give me <laughs> hours. Give me hours, because I I always tell people. Oh. Um, between four and six. Okay, where's that at now? Oh, um, uh, eight to nine every day. Mm. So you've controlled your mind, and and now I mean, there's, there there are certainly cases when you're up, right? Like there's yeah, incidents, yeah. or you're one off. You're, you're doing bug bounty, man. Like once you've got, once you're you know picking at that thing, you might be up all night. And yeah. I still love that, but for the most part, the goal is in bed so that I get eight hours of sleep. Take me through a day. In the life of Chris Gate. Oh man, it's boring. No, no, no. I want to know when you wake up, what mm. does that look like until you go to sleep? From work, okay. schedule, self, like medicating yourself in terms of meditation, what you need to drive. I want to know. Okay. Um, um, for a long time, I kept the phone downstairs. The phone comes upstairs now in Do Not Disturb, but only because. Um, priority of the morning when I get up is I don't check socials. I meditate, go to the bathroom, meditate. Um, and I use the news app for the most part I, because I, have, I like, I'm a news bio- person as well. Yeah. So I love the biofeedback. Uh, I love the gamification cause I don't want to miss a day. Um, you know, I got up to like 200 days and when we drove back from Sedona, I forgot on, on the trip back. So I was like, I had to restart. But I really like that. So priority number one of my day is meditation. Um, gym. So three days a week. Um, following that, it's go to the gym. What um, time do you, you usually wake up? Oh, hmm. well, after COVID, it's kind of late now. I'm going to be like eight right now. But okay. before that, it was like six, six thirty. Um, do you do you work for a company that is based out of uh, the West Coast or East Coast? Yeah. West Coast. So I get to cheat a little there. Yeah. That but. At, you know, at noon, at lunchtime, my time, people are just getting started. So yeah. I get to, I get to use that to my advantages. I can get it. I can get a late start on the East coast. Um, I have time from gym meditation, um, exercise, you know, those sorts of things. Um, yeah, then it's, so I've, I've read, um, it's like, you know, um, I have to look up his name. The, the book is indistractable and I've really taken to time bounding my day. And is so, that written by Cal Newport? Uh, nope, it's like Neil Ayer. Maybe okay. Maybe Maybe I can, I'll have to find it later. I got you. Do. I got but, you. Um, Go for it. Did you find it? Yeah, n- near near Ayer, near Ayer, N I R E Y A L. Amazing book. Um, it really talks about how, and I think the social dilemma covers this a bit you know, on Netflix, but how, you know, these things are designed to take your attention away constantly. And I was really finding myself losing attention constantly to these things. So, um, I check email and Slack first thing in the morning. I take care of anything that's supposed to be taken care of. And then I don't check Slack until the end of the day. Um, same thing for all the socials are all put in a folder called time wasters. I have to acknowledge that I'm going into my time waster folder mm. to view these things. No notifications for anything. Um, it's to bring back focus. So yeah. So uh, email Slack do work. I try to time box my days and figure out what I want to do. You do time uh, the, night, the night before I put the two most important things that I want to do personally. And then for work, um, mm. I don't do well with like those people that have like 50 things on a list. That's not what I do. I have one work thing that I want to accomplish, that I must accomplish and one personal thing that I must accomplish to, to say my day was a, su- a success. Mm-hmm. Um, I have plenty of other things on the to-do yeah. list. Like, my to-do list is like that long, but um, I picked the top two things because those are achievable for me. Yeah. Um, because I, I feel like shit when I don't get them done. So I don't want to put 10 things on a list if I'm not sure I'm going to get it done. So it top is- two things. That is the same thing that I do. I have highlights and then to do's. 
So the highlights are like things that I know are going to be champagne moments when yep. I yep. accomplish them. Yep. What's I mean, I think a lot of people could do well to say, what's the most important thing I can do tomorrow? Yeah. And then, and then in the evening, as we get to the evening ritual, we, we go through that. So, um, yeah, so works till six, seven, usually, because East Coast time or West Coast time. Um, and I and I started late, so I, I need to, I, I have like to make sure I'm getting my, my appropriate hours in for my employer. Um, family time for a few hours. Um, dinner, hang out with the kids, hang out with my wife, try to stay married. Um, and yeah, and then try to get into bed. So evening, evening is winding down, um, figuring out for the next day what is important um that that's crucial and then i have like a going to bed process which is self-reiki and also kind of like a it's an aura clearing if you will and so the idea is like i'm disconnecting from everyone that is connected to me that day that mm -hmm. i don't want to carry on with me and so i just imagine what what i see is like like a cotton ball and it has like i start at my feet and work up to my head and just like any little sticks or any little things that are stuck to that, I snip them out. Oh. And so I'm clearing the whole day. I love that. So I can go to bed oh. and not have any of that bullshit. I am uh, definitely going to take that. I like that. Yeah. I can, I can send you some stuff too. Yeah, definitely. Self definitely. Reiki is key. And it's only just a few minutes. Definitely. Do the shower in there somewhere too. <laughs> the reason why I said before, the reason why I said uh, Cal Newport, I read a book on digital minimalism. We're yeah. choosing a focused life in a nos noisy world. And to me, Cal Newport is one of my favorite authors of all time. Every book that he drops, I read. His thing is all about deep work. He has a, a book on deep work and how to like tactically getting to what matters to you and then how to like yeah. focus and get it. I think done. it's on my list to read. I think the person I work with, He's yeah. recommended all sorts of these really good books. He's yeah. the one that um, he was the second person to recommend Indistractable to me. Yeah, and Indistractable is amazing. Yeah, it so, really helped me with focus. Yeah, it, I I agree. For me, I try my hardest. I I what I think I want to do is eventually I want to have another phone that could do what I want besides like waking up, tracking my sleep. It's important to me because the first thing I do when I wake up is look at my phone to see how many hours I slept. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I am as tactical as it gets. I know what type of day I'm going to have. If I sleep anything over six hours and 53 minutes, I know I'm going to have, I'm going to perform at a high level. Anything lower than that, it's going to be two or three coffees type of day. <laughs> yeah. Anything lower than you know, five and a half hours, I'm going to struggle and I need to figure out, okay, what do I need to do to get done immediately before I need to, you know, recharge. So yep. that's good. Know, man. that's very self-aware. Yeah. I, I, I try to, like I said, I'm very self-aware on performance and what I want to do in my output. So I try to tackle that. And, and what I notice is that's why I love reading books because I can download someone's like, 20 year history on researching something in around 400 pages. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's what it is. But I would let everyone know we had another question from Rob and he goes, if you weren't solid in who you are and you feel imposter syndrome, how do you get to your point? How do I get to my point? Um, hmm. Oh man, you make me nervous every time I get the full screen here. Um, that's All a right. good question. I'm gonna I'm bring <laughs> it back. Do it, but, can I can uh, I start that off? Can I start that off and then? Yeah, I want please. You to take uh, it. Why don't you go and then I'll add? Yeah, <laughs> because because I have a lot of opinions on imposter syndrome. Right, I think when it comes to imposter syndrome, you're like, oh, I can't do this. No, you can. Right, I believe in oneself and what you can do. You could only be the best you can be. That self-doubt, that self-talk is something that's in here and not reality. So I know I'm good at one thing, a few things, and I know I'm good at that. And I know I'm good at learning things. And I know my process on how to learn things. This is why earlier in this conversation, I asked you, how do you learn things? Yeah. 
So if I don't know something, I'm not an imposter. I'm just like, yo, I, I can get to learn it. And if you give me the lead way, trust me, I'm going to put in the work because I will outwork anyone, I believe. Now, with that being said, you just got to trust yourself. You got to know yourself. Be self-aware of, hey, if I don't know it, that's fine. One thing, I had a conversation in 2015 at DEF CON at the pool with virus and he was talking about someone that he was like, man, I need to get up there. And I'm like, the problem is you don't stop to smell the roses. You've accomplished so much. You don't smell the roses and look at everyone that's behind you and how you need to help them get there. Instead of you trying to get to whoever you're, you're thinking of. And for me, I know there's a ton of people that are way better than me, but I know I'm confident in myself. I know, yes, I know I'm overweight. I need to lose weight. Yep, got that. Right? No one else could, like, tell me that. I know that. And it doesn't offend me because I know I have to lose weight, right? Or I need to get be a better programmer. I know I could develop shit. I'm just not a 9 to 5 develop a full stack application. I could do it. Don't get me wrong. It's going to take me time but I'm trusting myself that I can do it. And I think for me, when it comes to imposter syndrome, it is real. If you allow it to be real, if you want to feel like I'm not good enough, you're right. If you think you suck, you're right. If you think you're awesome, you're right. Whatever you say to yourself, that's self talk. You're going to be right. And as long as you're constantly putting yourself in a position to win, you will win. And that, that for, is that's an it. amazing answer. Uh, yeah. That, um, that's the start off. You go. Imposter syndrome. That's a man. Um, that's a tall one to, to go after. So I mean, I'm going to be all over the place. One, it's amazing that um, Virus was feeling that way because he is an Brilliant. amazing hacker and does things I could never, I feel like I could never do. Uh, but I think it's a similar vein of, if I put my focus, all my focus on doing one of the things that he's good at, I could probably get as good as he is, but he's just awesome, you know, awesome person. Um, so it's, I think probably the key there is that everyone experiences that. If someone that's as well-skilled as him feels that way, everyone feels that way. I have that. I know everyone kind of faces that. Yeah. I agree with you a thousand, a thousand percent. The stories we tell ourselves are the reality that we ha- we experience. So you need to be conscious of the things that you say to yourself and the way you speak to yourself, the way you speak about yourself. Mm-hmm. If you call yourself stupid or you call yeah. yourself incomplete in some way, um, your body listens to that, your mind listens to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, you start to manifest. I I always give this example and it's extreme, but I give it. I'm the type of dude that does not care what people think. I can walk with a cape and speedos in the street and I'm fine. Yeah. Cause I I, know who I am. I am not that way. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I know who I am and that's okay with me. And that's who there's two people I'm okay with myself and the person that really knows me. Right. And that's what I always tell people that self doubt. That's, that's the, that's the voice you need to control. That's inside. You need to control that inner voice. And if you control it and you know how to control it, you could, it's just like meditation. When that thought comes, you halt it. Mm -hmm. When you're not in meditation, when that thought comes, halt and you move forward. And I've had some great mentors in my life that has helped me do it not even in the industry but in my life in general right so for me i would tell everyone out there that has that imposter syndrome trust yourself yep i agree to keep yeah to add on like the i think the immediate answer to imposter syndrome is just do your best and you know when you're doing your best Mm. or when you're half-assing it like you know just you know like I, i either gave all i had on this on that thing or i phoned it in and you just need to be honest with yourself. There's two <laughs> things that I always say. You do do your best. And that's the best you can do. Yeah. And doing the second thing is doing the right thing 
is always the right thing to do. Yeah, man. Totally. It's always the right thing to do within yourself as well as other people and help other people. You know what I mean? I think the best satisfaction that I get is trying to assist someone. Doesn't matter if I'm at Walmart assisting someone with their bag in there. You feel good. It, it yeah. makes you feel good. You don't need a trophy for everything you do. Yeah. And I think a lot of people want a trophy for things that they do. And, you know, when you stop wanting to to get that accolade, that trophy, and this is, I, I believe, that's why the toxicity in, in cybersecurity is there is because they want that clout. They're clout tracers. And for me, I'm like, I'm good. I know I'm doing the best that I can. I don't need someone else to certify what I'm doing. I don't, I, I just don't need it. I'm, I'm trusting the process. I'm loving what I'm doing. I'm happy. I don't need a trophy to say I did this good thing. Yeah. Right. And this is what the hacker hackers mindset was, was built on. Right. We're, we're quarantined. And I started this as like, Hey, I'm just going live every day. And then I'm like, well, this is kind of, I can't, I can't maintain it every day, but what I could do is do once a week. Right. After a certain point, I think it was from March to to like June or May. Sorry to me. I was doing every day. I was like, I can't do it every day. It, it, my life is getting too busy to just stop and have people and do stuff. What I will do is once a week, have someone on, have a great conversation. And that will be my thing for the week, my contribution to the world, as well as tweets, as well as this, that and the other and life every day. And it's that energy. And that's what, what for me going into, going into a, a, a tangent is just trust the process, man. Just do what you need to do to take yourself to that next level, whatever it is, just trust it and, and be positive. We do have another question. What was the toughest technical hurdle you overcame? I'll go right behind you or in front of you if you want. Yeah, go ahead. While while I think I'll, of an answer, think it's, of that. There's so, been a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. So um, in 2018, I was uh, I moved over in Intel, and I was working on this amazing team, PAR team, and they did all UEFI stuff, and I was new to you know, the bios and how it was built and looking for vulnerabilities and fuzzing stuff because it was just like, why do you do stuff like this? Right. It wasn't, it, it was so new to me on how they, how things communicated and how to disassemble it. And when it goes into IDA pro, it doesn't recognize it. And, and then Giger came out and then that didn't recognize. So it, everything was new. I read books and it still didn't, really registered to the to the aspect that I I thought it was but what I did was I how I tackled it was reach out to people that are experts so as I reached out they helped me answer the questions that I needed to and I think a lot of people are afraid to ask questions because they don't want to show their vulnerability and I think when you're comfortable with yourself and it's okay you're good who, who's going to judge you when you're, when you're good with yourself? I dare anyone to judge me. I'm, I'm like, okay, okay. I'm fine with that. Oh, I'm not as skilled as X, Y, Z. Okay. That's good. And, and for the people that are watching out there, I'll give you another example. And then I want you to answer it. You're not going to get off the hook. All right. I was trying, I was hoping you'd forget. No, you're, you're going to, you're going to come back. Um, in 20, I want to say 16, I had like this Twitter beef. And this is when I was in the syndrome of still giving a fuck what people said. And what I noticed about myself was, I mean, this guy, he was trolling, right? But to me, where I'm from, you don't troll. Show your face. Let's go talk shit in front of my face. So this was going on for a few months publicly 
And the I was like, at DEF CON, let's handle this. We're all going to be in Vegas. Talk your shit then. And I want you to talk your shit in front of me to see if you got the bollocks to do that. Now, on Wednesday, a black hat, someone came up to me. I, 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 I know you know this person. And that person comes up and is like, look, I created this Twitter account, but I don't manage it anymore. Because someone's going to come to you and they're going to say that it's me. And it's not. I gave it to X, Y, Z. I was like, look, the next time someone tweets about that, I'm going to come to you because you're going to find out who did it. And I'm going to go to that person. Now, on Tuesday, someone someone reached out to me. And this is drama, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give how you overcome it. Right. Cause everyone deals with the drama, especially in this community. Yeah, for sure. So on Tuesday, someone came up to me and was like, look, they're coming after you. <laughs> Make sure you have like your passwords tight. They're trying to come after you. I was like, okay, I'm fine. So that person on, on Wednesday told me, Hey, I don't own it no more. But I told them, I said, listen, if they come and disrespect me, I'm coming to you. I mean, you are going to have a problem. And he was like, I don't want that. This, that, another. Thursday comes around, the guy tweets. He says, on my B-sides, I forget the, the, the name of it, the B-sides that, that, that had the pool and the hotel. I know I've seen you there. Anyway, I was like, all right, cool. I'm coming over there. I go over there. The person that is running B-sides at that time was like, I've seen your tweet. You're not coming inside because I know what you're going to do. It's <laughs> like, do what? What am I going to do? They, they tweeted. They, uh, and then I was like, look, I'll give you some money. You tell me who it is. She's like, I know who it is, but I'm not going to tell you. And at the end of the day, I didn't get in. And I'm happy that person didn't let me in. Because I sat down, I went and went on with my day. And I was just like, you know what? All this shit was a troll. And they, they won. Look yeah. at my energy. I'm, I'm all flustered. I want to get revenge. I'm upset. And we're at DEF CON. And from that day forward, I was like, I will never allow anyone to, to get me to the point of going for retribution or being upset or confronting someone. It's all the opinion. Like, and I learned that in 20, I think it was 2015, 2016. And I've never looked back since when people be like, Oh, you don't got skills. You suck. I'm like, cool. That's fine. I'm, I'm fine with your opinion. Like, yeah. I don't need you to certify me. I'm okay. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't understate, I understate how much of an advanced task. What you just said is it's extremely difficult to get to that point. I'm, I'm not even there and I'm working really hard at that. Um, I, I, we can go into that because <clears throat> I've, operated from like a zone of apathy for a long time yeah. where I wanted everyone to like me. Mm. And then it come to realize that you're suppressing who you are. And then this goes back to the mm -hmm. imposter syndrome thing too. If you're suppressing who you are for Twitter likes or for people that you don't care about to mm. like you, you're not doing yourself any favors. Mm. So you just should just be you and understand that there'll be a part, there'll be a portion of the population that is in love with that. There'll be a portion of the population that, that hate that. And are mm. absolutely repelled by that. And you just have to get to where that's okay. Because being who you are is far more important. Unless you're an asshole. But that's my joke. Didn't land, I guess. But, yeah. Uh, um, but, you know, like, when you're being yourself and you're compassionate and you're true and you're doing the self-work to understand who you are, who Chris is, who Marco is, eventually have to just get okay with that because suppressing who you are is just not great. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 now what I learned the most is anytime someone triggers you, why, why are they triggering you? Yeah. What is it? What is it? Why? Yeah. What I is mean, it? I mean, yeah. If you're I'm like, I why like to say when my, nostrils, why you when my nostrils flare, right? Like you read something and you're like, Oh man, here I go. That's a great time to look inside and be like, why am I getting upset at that? Especially if it's not even about me. Yeah. Why? And it's usually, it's an insecurity that I have about myself. Um, 
And that's what I'm saying. For me, I've uh, there's been times where someone is is literally trying to trigger me. I'm like, I'm good. You all right? You good? That's awesome, man. And right? You're, like, you're like <laughs> you won't you, listen. There's there's two difference. Like, you could try to trigger me, but you won't disrespect me, just because where I'm from, right? Like, you're <laughs> not gonna try to like like do something or or try to have a physical contact to trigger me. Like that's not going to happen. But if you're trying to troll, I'm just like, I'm good with walking away. Like I'm good. I'm okay. My ego is good. I'm fine. I know who I am. I'm good. You, you want to, you want to check on, on your to-do list of whatever it is. I'm fine with that. And I think a lot of people, if you get to that point where you're comfortable of who you are and you know, what, what you've done and how you've done it, how you carry yourself, you gotta, you gotta be okay with that. And that's, yeah, that's what sure. it is. You know, that it worked, but yeah. Uh, so to answer the question, the original question, I would mm-hmm. say like two things like exploit dev. I still have, I still struggle with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, yeah, with like Python and making things that are not in one giant file. You know, like where you have the 600 line yep. um, piece of code where you, you architect things and where they go into libraries and understand how things pull in. And yeah, any software engineer or anybody that's have a decent, like, man, dude, that's the easiest thing. But that's what I struggled with was understanding that. I was like a really, really felt like I was a late bloomer to coding. When I took coding classes in college, I struggled. Um, and I didn't actually get the concepts until way after I had graduated. Um, but, but part of that's the way West Point teaches and like the pace that things went at. Um, but when I graduated and when I started putting out goals for who I wanted to be in this, this field, I, I put a goal and, you know, from the law of attractors, so I want to be able to solve problems with code was one of the things that I put out there. And I will feel like I had been, that I had matured as, as a, I, IT professional or as a pen tester when I could do that. And I eventually got there. I actually feel like I can solve problems with code. And maybe not the fastest, but I can get it done. Okay. So what, what are you doing or what did you do in the past to get better on writing Python code? Um, <laughs> wrote Weird Al with Ken. <laughs> I mean, I just mean to pick a project and just do it. Yeah. Um, and that, and that, that project was born out of just doing AWS pen tests and, um, you know, doing just, Hey, I found this AWS key. What does it do? And there wasn't really a tool that would answer that question for me. And I was like, Hmm. I, and, and that, and all that really sprang from bug bounty because I would find them and I'd be like, cool. I want to know what this does so I can get paid for it. And we ended up writing that tool as a, as a way to answer that question. It turned into more because I now use it to just solve problems at work. So when I need to like ask a question of AWS and maybe getting a lot of output on the AWS CLI is not great, um, I'll, I'll write that in Weird Al so I can save it or I can at least pipe it to JQ or do something so that I can read it. Um, okay, so when yeah, you want- Get better, to- find a project that you need that needs to be solved and for sure. That's what I'm doing with Golang is rewriting some things and writing some things. And it's been a struggle because it's a new language and it has its own things that are weird. Okay, when did you start with uh, Golang? This year. Okay, and what was the what was the initial process? Let's go back to that. Um, I'm fascinated on on how people learn. Oh, um, I mean, I can say what it is. We're writing a client to to, to interact with uh, Intrigue.io's API. So John Cran's amazing tool. Um, we use it and um, wanted to be able to do more with the data. And it has an API. And so normally I just would have done that in Python, but um, more and more Silicon Valley companies want, if you're going to write a service, they want it to be in Go mm-hmm. um, for all the reasons that Go exists. And so I was like, cool, this is this is the time to just do the pain. And it was hard. It's took me, you know, many, many, many uh, exponential levels longer to do this in Golang than I could, I could have done it in Python in a day. It took me days and days and days and days and had to read a lot of books and stack over four things and uh, ask coworkers and just, but that's how that's, I enjoy that. The process is amazing because what, at the end you have like 
at least a better not like I can at least write some things and go before before I couldn't write anything and I just kept putting it off and putting it off. Well, what was that learning gap? How many months, weeks, or whatever? Um, I mean, we got how? Um, I mean, we wrote the thing in a week or two. Nice. Also, I wouldn't it was, say that it I'm was like a it. sprint. It was like a sprint that you was just like. Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah, it was like a forced. I, I do better with with timelines and um, because I let the. Uh, I think the joke I make is I let the energy take me where it goes, which means I'm kind of flighty sometimes and I can be easily distracted. Um, I have to have a timeline or things just don't get done. So how many hours um, did you, I didn't get back to you, whoever, that's why. Um, but, um, yeah, I said to put a timeline on it. So this has to be done this quarter for this project. So that's how many hours in those two weeks you put in per day? Oh, it was like most six, eight, six, eight a day for five, six days. Very, very strategic in terms of understanding that tool as well as books, Stack Overflow. Was it more? Yeah, I mean, there's um, uh, John Calhoun was the guy who runs Gopher Sizes. Mm -hmm. And um, I just started just watching that guy. He has videos that go and explain uh, what he's doing. And I was just kind of following along and reading. And What was the uh, name again? uh, I'm pretty sure it's Gopher Sizes. Okay. (laughs) Okay. See if I can find it. What What do you think is next? Do you think uh, Go is gonna go ahead and make a big run over the next have, five six years? Rust, Python. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> really yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think when it comes down to it, I think these two hours we spent it's the longest shit, almost three hours. It's the longest I've spent because I'm I'm enjoying this um, conversation and well I'm a super awesome person and I'm very interesting so of course you are yes absolutely <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna in Spanish we call it déjame echártelo which is let me put it on you here you go <laughs> so uh, the the thing is it's it's interesting because we go left to right right and at the end of the day it's it's learning about oneself. And it doesn't matter if you're learning technical or just learning about your chakra or meditation or anything. It's, it's the key is about having that, that hacker's mindset and learning and, and taking yourself to that next level. And Chris, it's been amazing. And I am going to reach out because I want to learn more. I want to do some lessons. I want to, I want to take it to that level of, of, um, figuring out my own energy. Right. I always uh, want that's my myself. current new passion is helping people not hate their existence on this planet. So, um, I really, really enjoy doing that for people. Well, so, yeah. Okay. So my passion is l- loving life and, and being happy. So I want you to try to take me to that next level. And that's a challenge because I love my life and what I do and, and trying to help someone. But I always believe there's always a percentage that I can get better every single day. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to reach out to you, Chris. Thank you for your time. Hey, thanks for asking me. This has been amazing. I know, I know a lot of people out there that are going to watch this or that have been watching the live stream is going to have a lot of questions. Make sure you DM Chris at Cardinal Ownage on Twitter. My DMs are open. Help. Yes. You can hit me up. Yes, and and there's a lot of love and help. Same here. Whatever I could do for you guys, just let me know. I want to be of service. I want to provide value to anyone that watches this because, like I said earlier, it brings me joy. So, Chris, any final words? I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you go. Mm. Um, vibe up. Just focus on that. Bring that vibration up in everything you do. Well, Thank you guys for joining. It was a long one, but there's a lot of nuggets and I'm excited for next week's show. Thank you, Chris. I greatly appreciate it. Guys, I'll see you guys next week. Take care. Head up.